Okay, thank you, Ilantha, our ANS minister. I'm Isolta Broselliand, Pam Perryman on Facebook, and um, I'm a Laurel and a Pelican. I've been around a long time, and uh, I know things. So <laughs> here I am doing this. One of my pet things is how to run good competitions. I was a high school English teacher for 30 years, and I know a thing or two about using rubrics because I taught advanced placement composition for 20 of those years. And you're basically teaching to a test, you're getting the students familiar with rubrics and showing them how the rubric actually helps you know what to do. And I wanted to share some of that background with SCA folk. Um, I want to start with just the idea of competitions themselves. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why people compete. Sometimes it's because they want the prize. You know, it's the thing and they'd like to get it. Sometimes they compete because we want recognition. We want the attaboy that comes with that. Or maybe people are following a laurel path and a competition is definitely a good way to get your stuff out there and seen by laurels, whether it's a, you know, a, a local uh, principality or a kingdom uh, championship or whether it's just a, a competition at Eggles turning. Um, some people just like competing because it's, it's an adrenaline boost and it just makes you feel alive. Um, so I've run into people who like competitions because they said if it weren't for the competition, I'd never finished my projects. And that's very real too. Um, competitions are also a terrific place to meet other competitors and meet the judges because they're people who share your particular passion. Um, and also one of the reasons personally <clears throat> I've entered competitions is I like to see how I measure up against other people who are doing similar things. I want to get the feedback. If the judges are good judges, I'm hoping to get expert feedback on what could be improved and maybe even some pointers on how to improve it. So there are a lot of different reasons to compete. Um, but basically a competition is by definition, jumping through hoops, hoops that someone else has set up. And it's really important from both the standpoint of the people putting on the competition and the people entering it, that you know what the hoops are. How big is it? How high off the ground? What are the parameters? What are the criteria? What are you being judged on? Without knowing that, you're kind of just throwing your thing out there and saying, judge me, which ends up becoming a source of anxiety because a competition is a judging of the thing or a process. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's not a judging of you as a human being. But if the criteria for the judging isn't really clear, I think it's really easy for people to feel like they're being judged, not their creation being judged. So it's, it's also important for the well-being of your contestants that the competition be clearly de defined and the judging parameters be clear. So if you're entering a competition, I, I mean, I think, and I, both from a personal and a professional standpoint, it is perfectly okay. In fact, you should ask to see the judging forms. Ask for a copy of how you're going to be evaluated because then you know what's being asked of you. And, you know, it seems to me only fair. For example, I, in past years, and I won't say how long ago, have, was asked to judge a costume contest at Eggles Tourney. There were no real criterion. The thing was set up. I was asked day of to judge. There were not any um, parameters. So what is the best costume? Was it the prettiest one? Was it the one with the most 
technical expertise in the sewing of a garment? Was it the most historically authentic garment? I mean, those are three very different sets of criteria and you would get totally different winners depending on which one was the, you know, the, the rubric, the criteria that was supposed to be the, the one. So, you know, it's, it's not fair to competitors not to know what they're, what they're being asked to do. Um, one of the things I'd like to know up front from you folks is what are the area, what is the area or areas plural that you might want to be competing in or have competed in? Because if I know that, I know my audience a little better and I can offer better um, examples. So what are you all likely to enter into a competition? Johanna? No, of course you asked me. Um, what I have entered or what I would be likely to enter futuristically. Have entered, have entered um, heraldic display. Uh, I have entered costuming and I have entered things. That's pretty much it for things. Okay. Um, okay. Most well, of the other stuff has been action. That's good. Tori, how about you? What would you be interested in? Scrabble stuff? Probably that or garb. Okay. Um, Steve, how about you? Um, pretty much uh, uh, research papers or even when I enter a thing, uh, my documentation ends up being pretty much a research paper. Okay. And you've done things like mead and beer and and beekeeping and uh, 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 history of technology sort of things. And okay. So. Cool. How about you, John? I don't know that I'm interested in all. Oh, my. Just pure <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> Making mail, maybe? <laughs> um. Okay, Magda from the West. I have an event. Uh, I, I have entered uh, Bardic's and um, sculpture, but and have something of an interest in. Oh, and and um, it, it, Dirty Dozen for. Um, uh, or Jess. Thank you. Yeah, ah. blanking. Okay. <laughs> uh, Dirty dozen largesse competitions, um, but the the whole parameters thing freaks me the heck out. I'm I really I have no plans to enter anything because I just I uh, a, more than a little intimidated at the thought of entering anything. Okay, well, there with um, you, Magda. That's why we're here tonight. Yeah, I will speak to that definitely. Yes. Um, Dagonel, what, what are your areas of interest? Cooking, uh, calligraphy and illumination, and performing arts. Okay. And um, let's see, Holler? Holler? Bjorst from Starson from Kaid. They have responded oh, in the chat. Oh, okay, Brewer. Okay. And Alan says woodworking, jewelry. Okay, ceramics. Um, Miriam? Hello? Some people don't have quick access okay. to the uh, audio, and sometimes okay. it's just darn hard to find those little microphone icons. Yeah. Okay. Well, that gives me some idea so I can pull examples from things that will actually make sense to you. Um, so the Kingdom A, uh, Kingdom ANS put together this rubric, and the woman that did it was 
was, I think still is a teacher. And I think she did a very good job for the most part because she actually pulled in a lot of different aspects. Um, and I would like to start looking at what's called the, the primer for judging forms. The URL for that is at the very uh, top of the chat column. So if you down below, if you click on chat, you should get a white column on the right side of your screen. And at the top of that, it says, look at the primer for judging forms. And if you click on that, you'll go to that page, you'll, you'll lose your um, Zoom video, but I think you'll still be able to hear me. If you've downloaded it and have it printed out, great. But um, if, you, if you can't access it, I'll explain enough that you'll know what I'm talking about. But um, this is a sort of an introduction to the rubric. And Pam, I, yes. have, I have posted that at the bottom of the chat. Or, or okay, so that's it. there again. Uh, I'm what? not seeing it, but. Look at the judging form objects. It should be in the chat. Look at the primer. I think it gave you all of them. Yeah. So um, where this starts is, um, and I really want to emphasize this, it says judges should not change how they use these rubrics based on the level of competition they are assessing. In other words, you could say, oh, these are for Kingdom ANS. We don't want to use that at the baronial level because it'll be too hard. But what this rubric is intended to do is to show the competitor and the judges the whole range of what's possible. You don't expect everyone to be an expert. In fact, very few people are experts. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a separate word for expert, right? And we all start, we all are beginners in everything we do at some point in our lives. So this just gives you a continuum. And on the first page of the primer, it, it gives you an example from the historical accuracy and authenticity rubric. And it says there are six categories. You've got six things there. The first one is beginning. The second one is emerging. Those two are considered developing level. You know, you're getting started. You're just getting a feel for what you're doing. So that would, you know, one or two points per category if you're in that range. What's considered the accomplished range is competent, the three-point column, or strong, the four-point column. So if you're looking at the first category, which is how well is the period appropriate aesthetic expressed in the object created? In other words, how period does this thing look? Um, beginning, the object is fully modern. Okay, it's not period yet. At two points, some effort was used, made to make the object look historical, but it still looks mostly modern. Once you get into the accomplished range, competent, a roughly equal blend of modern and historical aesthetic, okay? And four, strongly accomplished, the object may have slightly modern characteristics, but largely historical in appearance. Okay, that's four is pretty much the level at which people aim to play in the SCA unless they want to become experts. So the exceptional columns, five, is exemplary. It's like way historically accurate in aesthetic appearance to all except the most rigorous inspection. Pretty good. Column six is a bonus point. So max is five. If you get a six, it's because everybody is going, oh my goodness, you are you know, <laughs> so you don't expect to get six. Six, the sixth one is a gift because they're in awe of you. And that doesn't happen very often. So you have to think of this as a five point scale with the normal goal is probably a four. Um, there are six levels, there are 20 categories. 
Okay, so if five is your maximum, you have a hundred points. What does it take to be an on tier, a scholar of on tier? 80 points. That's basically perfect fours. That gives you 80 points and you know four points per category and 20 categories. So you're considered right up there with the, you know, the cream of the crop if you can pull fours. So if you think of the rubric that way, then it maybe isn't so intimidating. You know, and that's um, uh, at the local level. I mean, I think most people who are playing are probably playing around level two and three, emerging, competent. You know, they have some knowledge. Unless you're a specialist, you might be content not to have to move beyond that because maybe you're into service or you're into fighting or or whatever. But I, I think that looking at a six, you know, the six columns and you're going, oh, my goodness, I'll never make it to number six. Well, nobody expects anybody to make it to number six, frankly. Um, and that's something that's that's very important to remember. Um, you know, because remember, again, the context of this, it's the object that's being judged, not you. Um, and if you can make that separation, it makes competitions a lot easier, um, but there are also displays. I mean, you don't have to compete, but um, you might be at the developing level in some of the stuff you do, you might be at the accomplished level at other things that you do. So, you know, it's not like your abilities in a given area are all gonna be consistent. You might be really good on making it look good, but you might not be using period tools. Well, there's room for improvement, but you know it's not terrible. Uh, Bonnie, you've got a hand up. Thank you. I'm one of those people who's been intimidated. I entered contests probably 30 years ago, but not since. And I'm impressed that this explanation already has removed my fear. <laughs> wow. it's like, oh, I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. This is already going a big wow in my brain. I mean, it's just, I mean, this is a game we play. We're here to have fun. And if you think about going into a competition to meet the other people who share your geek and want to talk about it, if you go into a competition thinking, oh boy, I'll get some experts to give me some advice. In a sense, if you don't expect to win, you don't lose. You gain what you gain, which is probably interpersonal satisfaction and information. And those are really good things. <laughs> um, so let's kind of, I mean, I guess my advice is aim for a four for the aesthetic stuff. And as we go through this, don't worry so much about the period tools because that's a whole other level of stuff. Um, it's harder, it takes more work, it takes more time, it very often takes more money. Um, and if you really get into something, it'll come. If you're not into it that much, you don't need it. So um, if you- So may I say a case in point on that fact? Yes. Because I accidentally fell into that. Um, I had, I put some arm guards I had made for archery um, yeoman for the barony into a competition. And I was told a lot more than I had any clue about on um, medieval leatherworking, which I didn't even realize was completely different from modern leatherworking. And one of the things they mentioned was they used, instead of metal tools, they used wood tools that they would carve themselves for stamping. And I was like, well, I can do that. So on my next project, I actually did half and half, modern and medieval, one on each side, so that I can now go around and show people, um, this is modern, this is medieval, see how it's different? And it was really fun. And cool. that I just got because, I, because somebody told me when they were judging me what was different about what I had done versus what was medieval. And that's what a good judge does. Because let's face it, a teacher, in modern world, 
as I was in an English department, I'm both teaching and evaluating. I'm both supposed to help you learn something and then rate you on it, which is difficult. Believe me, they're totally different roles in many ways, but they don't have to be. And that's a great case in point. Um, so let's take a look at the actual rubric. It's there in the chat bar. Um, I'm going to work with the judging form for objects. The judging form for process is virtually the same. Um, it's instead of a thing, you might be recreating, say you want to recreate how you did period dying in the 16th century England. Um, Master Eduardo did one of those. And it's like, I don't want to show you the thing I died. I want to demonstrate the process that I investigated to be able to talk about what it takes to do that as opposed to buying a package of writ and throwing it in the washing machine. Um, so, but the same things apply to both. Um, if you, let's see, okay. If you were to look at the overview of the rubric, there are 20 different points on which you're going to be judged at a potential of five for each one. So out of those 20, the main categories, the first one, historical accuracy and authenticity has five areas. That's 25% of the entire contest is, is authenticity and ac historical accuracy. So that's big. I mean, we are, after all, a recreation organization. That's how we get our tax exempt status. We're educational. So that looms large. So that has to be a component of what you do. Documentation has four areas. So that's 20% of your entry. Technical ability, four areas, another 20%. Complexity, four areas, another 20%. And then there's presentation and display, which is, in my mind is totally modern. It's how you present the thing. That you should be able to figure out. You don't have to do anything SCA-ish for that. That's, um, that's 15%. So when you look at it that way, you can kind of think, how am I going to approach presenting my little object to be judged? If I know that a quarter of what I'm being judged on is how authentic it is, then I'm going to focus a fair amount of energy there. And as we go through this, I'll show you how some of these come back around and speak to the same thing so that if you do well here, then you can also do well further down the line. Conversely, if you don't do so well in some of the historical accuracy things, it'll come back to bite you again later and you'll, you'll lose a few points, but you can pick them up in other places. So if your goal is winning, then you need, it's a game, right? You're gonna win the game. Then you need to game the system. You need to understand what the criteria are, where you already excel and where you need to work more and figure out how to maximize what you do. The wiggle room comes in the presentation. The more articulate you can be, the more at ease you are in explaining what you're doing, you, pick, you, you can pick up points that way. So, you know, it's, it's a balance. If you don't care about winning, it doesn't matter. You look at the rubric to say, well, what do I need to learn? And the rubric can tell you what you need to learn to do a good job with this thing. So we'll start with the first category, which is historical accuracy or authenticity. And the first one is how well is the period appropriate aesthetic expressed? In other words, how period does it look? And that's the appearance. For competitions, it needs to be better than the 10 foot rule. I assume you're familiar with that, like it's okay from 10 feet, don't look at the details or how I finished my seams. In a contest, they're gonna look at your seams. They're gonna look at you know, the up close of the, the scribal work. They're gonna um, you know, 
go into the details. So the appearance is very important. And, and that's one to really work on. You want to make sure that everything that you can work with, especially with your materials, will give you a period look. So part of that is the tools. That's point number two. To what extent were period appropriate tools used to produce the object? You're going, I used a sewing machine. Okay. Can you hand finish the trim or tack down your seams that way so that the long seams maybe are, are machine sewn? I always say, I have my servant Bianca. I have a white sewing machine. She does all the boring long seams. I do the finish work. Um, so period tools, obviously, if you want five points out of that, all of the tools to produce the object were historical. That's a whole other rabbit hole to fall down. Are you going to make your wooden stamping tools? Are you going to pee into a bucket for a month to collect the urine to do real period dyeing? Or are you going to buy the chemical? So, you know, um, that one is probably where most people have a problem simply because you can't always buy the tools, the period tools. Sometimes you have to make them. And, you know, there you are. Um, the third one is period materials. And that one we have better control of. When I started in the SCA in the early 80s, China was not I'm selling. Not recorded or anything, Andrew. Hello? Okay. Um, you couldn't buy silk. So we used rayon that draped like silk. I mean, that's all you could do. If, if you could afford silk, it was probably Indian silk. And a lot of that was not as drapey as would have been available in periods. So, um, you know, the materials can be a problem. And it's, easier now. Sometimes, um, you know, usually you can buy them. You can buy linen. You can buy wool instead of a wool blend. Um, you can get silk instead of a silk blend or polyester or rayon. Um, if you're recreating a cap, there's one from the Renaissance made of byssus, which is a fiber that's made out of a shellfish that grows off the coast of Italy, and it's almost extinct you're not going to be able to get that material. You could replicate the cap using silk, but you know sometimes it's just gone. If you're a cook and you're trying to do a Roman recipe with silphium, it's extinct. So you have to substitute. So you know that one you you have a much better shot at, but it depends on what you're what you're doing. Um, you don't choose the exotic South American wood, you use wood that was available in Europe. You know, if you're really gonna pursue it, you figure out what kind of wood would have been used for this piece of furniture or sculpture or whatever, and then use that, um, you know, so that you can peel back layers of authenticity in your materials. <clears throat> Number four is the techniques and processes. And that's a little harder to do as well, because um, some of the techniques and processes used in period were dangerous, poisonous, um, you know, not something you want to breathe or do. So you have to temper that with um, good sense and safety. Uh, if, you know, and that goes for materials too. If you're looking at medieval, or uh, I'm sorry, English Renaissance um, Elizabethan makeup, you're not gonna put white lead on your face, I hope. Um, but you could use other white makeup. So um, the techniques and processes, again, that speaks to how deep your research has gone and how much you understand. Now, and this comes up, um, in number five, how well has the artist explained and compensated for the use of modern materials or methods or tools for that matter? So if you, because of cost or availability, 
use some modern aspect, if you could explain to the judges what would have been done in period, they would have used white lead on their faces, but instead I'm using talcum powder or whatever, because I don't want to go crazy with lead poisoning. It shows that you know what you're talking about, but you chose for the reasons you're giving not to do that. So you could talk about, I know that in period they would have dished this out, this piece of metal using certain tools. I didn't have those tools, but I did have the modern equivalents. So I used those, but I know what would have been done and how it would have been done in period. That's going to boost your score. So again, it speaks to the depth of your knowledge and preparation. So that, you know, that's going to help. Um, any questions, comments about the authenticity part? Okay. Um, <clears throat> category two is documentation, and it's kind of the other half of the authenticity thing. It's how did you know this was what was authentic? And this is where you um, show where you learned what authenticity meant for this thing that you're that you're presenting to be judged. So six just speaks to the organization. That should be a piece of cake. How is the documentation coherent, well-organized, easy to follow? In other words, if, if you have written documentation, have you included your sources? Have you defined terms? Um, that's, you know, that's pretty straightforward. And actually at Eggles Tourney, there will be a very good class in that taught by Raven, uh, Magister Raven Caraton on authenticity and documentation. But um, you just, you need to present the documentation in a way that's easy to understand and follow. Um, no mystery there. The research point seven is how thoroughly did you research it? And this is where this will come out maybe in the first category, authenticity, as you explain, okay, I use this modern thing, but in period we would have done this with these materials and these tools. And you know that shows that you have a depth of research and you understand the context in which you're operating. So why would blue have been a very precious color? Was it blue from copper salts? Was it blue because it's a ground up lapis lazuli? Um, you know, and if you can explain that, then your judges know that you've gotten into your subject. So um, you want to use, and this is where you get into, um, levels of sources and that's you know primary sources it's things that were written in period you're looking at the manuscript you're reading de re metallica and about renaissance metalworking you're um you've gone to a museum and seen the object or you've seen really good quality photos of all sides of the object you haven't just read about it but you've studied it as much as you can Secondary research is technically photographs, but it also might be a dig, a uh, secondary source. It might be a dig report. The uh, archeologist dug up a wooden bowl that was preserved in wet soil. Well, you can get pictures of it. You can look at it in a museum. The archeologist can also write about it and talk about the tests that were done on it, the kind of wood it is, what looks like the tool marks, that kind of thing. So good secondary sources are, I think, also essential. A tertiary source is you took a class about it. So some teacher who looked at primary, secondary sources, pulled that all together and then told you about it. That is probably where you're going to start. That's where you hear about stuff. You go to Wikipedia and you go, oh, right, there's this thing. What you do then is you go down to the bottom and you look at the bibliography, the sources, and you go, okay, here's the real stuff. And then you go off and look at that. So the more you can use primary and good secondary sources, 
the better off you are. And not just narrowly focused on the object, but looking at what was the function of the object, in what context would it have been used? Is this an everyday object? Is this a religious object? Is this something that wealthy people used? Is this something that the everyday person would use? You know, the more you can do that kind of stuff with your research, the better your score is going to be. Um, point eight is the connection between the documentation and the entry. So having explained what your documentation was and seeing the object, you should now be able to explain pretty clearly that you saw this picture. And when you saw it from that angle, you knew that it had to be this way because from the front, you can't tell that. But from the back, you know that something else was involved. That's what this speaks to, connecting the documentation to what you actually produced. Um, you know, we know that the average knife from Scandinavia is one of these types, but this particular one I reproduced from Burka had this particular shape on the blade. I can document that. This isn't the average knife, it's a specific knife. Okay, that's, you know, speaks to authenticity. And you've now made the, the connection between your research and what you actually produced. Um, and then, of course, nine is explanation of the process. And we come back to the same thing. Can you explain what you did, given what you know, maybe you couldn't do it exactly the same way, but you at least know how it was done in period. And this is why you did it in a modern way. So, you know, again, the explanation part comes back and you can pick up those points again in category number nine, explanation of process. And that's, that's what I meant by some of the stuff comes around several times. After documentation, the rubric moves on to the third category, which is technical ability. And there are, again, four points here. This is the level of competency. So this speaks a little bit to how complicated a thing is that you did. Um, for example, did you do simple calligraphy with a, with a simple illuminated border? Or did you do a very elaborately calligraphed scroll with gold leaf or silver leaf or special treatments on it? You know, it, you could do a really good job on a simple piece. You might do a pretty good job on a more complicated piece, but you attempted more complicated things and you're gonna get credit for that. You know, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with doing something simple well, because that's how we start. We master the simple stuff, and then you go on to the more complicated um, techniques. But um, so point 10 is understanding the appropriate aesthetic. This to me seems a little vague, but I think what it means is why did it look this way? Um, it has to do with the materials that were available, with the processes that were available, the belief systems, like it's okay to eat this, but not that. So we're only going to do this and not that. And why it would be wrong to substitute pork for a Seder meal or something like that. Um, so that you, um, it has to do with the context of the thing, why it is the way it is. Um, and then competency with appropriate period tools or with appropriate period materials, that's kind of self-explanatory. You know, it's, and if you weren't able to use period tools, again, you can at least talk about how they would have been used. Even if you used a bandsaw, what would it have been like to use a hand jigsaw? Something like that. Um, and then point 13, um, competency with appropriate period techniques and processes. So, you know, these all can be explained even if you can't do them. So you're going to lose some points in this category if you're not using ultra period materials and tools, but you can make some of it up by knowing about it. Um, 
any questions about that? Because this is, is this is kind of a it, it gets a little nebulous sometimes. So far, so good. Okay. Um, since we don't all have the thing in front of us, could you actually read out the statement at the beginning of each category? Okay, technical ability is literally the level of competency of a period appropriate skill set necessary to produce the object. So, you know, in other words, what skills would you have needed in period? So, to use your example, carving the wooden stamp to stamp your leather. You probably didn't go out and buy one. You probably had your taught your apprentice how to carve it, and then you stamp the leather. Um, it's the le it, it's basically the level of craftsmanship. So um, the top, you know, it, it, at the five point level, the top level, the artist possesses a thorough knowledge of appropriate aesthetic and able to fully realize it in their execution. In other words. They understand what it should have looked like in period, and they can make it do, look that way. You demonstrate uh, competency of all the period appropriate tools, all the period appropriate materials, and techniques. So, you know that's that's basically that one. Category four complexity has to do with the difficulty or challenge or level of ambition represented by the object. In other words, is this an object that an apprentice might have made? Is this an object that a journeyman might have made? Or is this an object that a master might have made? Um, the complexity of a piece should be con considered within the context of the genre of the piece. In other words, judging your thing against other period things like it, not the other objects in the competition. Because you're competing against, you're trying to reproduce the period thing. And if you have a, a, a stamped leather book that you're entering and somebody else has carved a bowl, they're entirely different things. You can't compete against each other. You can compete against what a book would have looked like in period and what a carved wooden bowl would have looked like in period. And this is where, for people running the contest, you have to choose your judges wisely. And sometimes they ask ahead of time, what are you entering? So they can get judges that know what they need to know in order to judge your stuff. If I were asked to judge hoopa bonds, I wouldn't do so well. I do 12th century, I do Anglo-Saxon and Merovingian, but I have a passing knowledge, but not an expert knowledge. So if the garb entries were predominantly late period, I would not be a good judge for that contest. So, Amen. you know, that's, that's something that's important if you're running contests to, to know. Um, so Alan yes. has an interesting um, example of mm -hmm. something in the chat. Okay, silver. Oh, right, your ring. And um, so you'd need somebody who was familiar with period metalworking techniques to be able to evaluate that and to understand, you know, you can understand why you use silver because you can afford it and not gold, but you, yeah, obviously you're not gonna use the lead in the alloy. So, um, you know, that's the competency then would be explaining that I left the lead out because I didn't wanna die. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, that's, that's important because then it speaks to the depth of your knowledge. Um, complexity. Um, okay, so it's point 14. How well does the artist achieve the vision of their project and period aesthetic? In other words, what they were aiming to do, how does that match up with what was done in period? I think that's kind of a little subjective because it's talking about the vision of their project. And I, you know, there could be communication problems with that one. Um, 
15 is clearer. What level of complexity does the object represent within its genre, time, or place? So how hard, for example, would it have been to make that ring as opposed to making the Sutton Who helmet? <laughs> to take an extreme example of all different kinds of metalworking and decorative stuff. Um, so that people who undertake a more complicated um, project, object to make, are gonna be judged against how well they did that. And the person who picked the simpler one is going to be judged against how well they succeeded with that. Now, they may have had more success with their simple project than someone did with a complex project, but you're gonna get credit for trying something harder too, because 16 is difficulty. How challenging are the techniques or processes or materials used to produce the object? You know, if you're talking about metalworking, if somebody makes a really nice knife by cutting up and sharpening a modern saw blade, that's way different than if you do your own pattern welding to make a blade. You know, you've chosen a more complex thing to do. Um, and that would go, you know, for scribal or, um, you know, the, the level of uh, scribal stuff you're doing. You know, if you're doing a simple charter and painting it, and it looks really good, that's great. If you have created an award scroll with all these fancy techniques, that's more complex. So you would score more on the level of complexity in 15 and 16, the difficulty. How challenging was it to do? I mean, some things are just plain more complicated than others. Um, and then 17, what level of preparation, skills, knowledge were required to do this object? In other words, you could do something that involved using a modern skill that you already had. But if you already know how to sew, but then you take on doing cartridge pleats or drafting your own patterns or you know, doing something more complicated, that's where that's going to win you a few more points um, because you just, um, it took more preparation, it took more learning to get to where you are. Um, and you get credit for that effort and that learning here. So that leaves us at the last category, which is presentation and display. And frankly, guys, I think this is where you can knock it out of the ballpark because it's pretty straightforward. 18 is communication. How well did the artist communicate his or her knowledge? Okay, practice it. Sit down, your spouse, your friend, sit in front of a mirror and explain it. You know, are you making sense? Have somebody who is at least a little bit knowledgeable listen to you and say, I don't get what you mean here. And rephrase, try it on somebody who doesn't understand it then you really have to explain things. Talk to yourself, driving around, sitting in the shower, waiting in the doctor's office. You know, those are all times when you could be running through this in your head and just practicing. So to get a four or five, you need to be able to communicate the breadth and depth, providing many details to demonstrate your knowledge. In other words, you need to be in command of your subject matter and be able to talk about it. Questions. The communication part is your output. You got to organize that and it comes out as a package. You're giving a little talk. Questions require you to repackage that same knowledge so it'll fit into somebody's specific question. Because remember, the difference between self-expression and communication Self-expression is the holy blurt. It's the poem the sixth grader writes about how wonderful it is to have a new puppy. Um, communication is explaining what kind of dog it is. You know, the self-expression may not care. It's happiness and joy. 
the communication is what kind of dog I got and how. And that's geared to convey information into somebody else's brain. Whereas the first one is just getting it off your chest, emoting, expressing it. So that's what the question question is about. It's can you answer somebody else's question and elaborate on the issue and tie it into other stuff? It's another way of getting at how well do you know your material? And if you know your material well, that's not a problem because somebody will say, well, I don't understand why you do this first and that second. You'll say, well, because having done it, you know why. Um, you know, so that's, that's nothing mysterious. It, it's just part of knowing your stuff. The twin, number 20 is display. And if you have any kind of display, whether it's a, a poster board or a, a, a written up documentation or how you present your object, you know, you just plop the thing down on the table or did you put it into a context? Did you put your beautiful bowl that you lovingly made out of this wonderful piece of wood into context with some other utensils so that you could show how it was being used at table? Um, how does that enhance the understanding of your object? So speaks to context, um, its presentation. You know, did you throw the slab, slab of fish down on the plate or did you make a nice arrangement of stuff around it so that it really looks pretty as well as effective? Um, so those are the 20 categories. Um, and it's, I mean, it really isn't rocket science. It's, it's pretty straightforward. What we're doing is historical recreation. Um, it requires that you do some research, that you learn some stuff, that you be able to use the stuff to produce something and be able to talk to people about it. And that's really all it is. It's what you do with your friends when you geek out about something. And if you can remove the booga, booga, booga about all oh, those awful laurel judges, as long as you don't have one of those awful laurel judges because they do exist, but it's just talking about your thing. You're getting your geek on in an organized fashion. And the more effectively you do that, the better you do in a competition. And this is where if you're running a contest, I think it's very important to sit down with your judges ahead of time and review the rubric if it's not one they're familiar with. And even if they're using one they might have used before to go over points that you think are important so as not to put people off. Now, when I've taught classes about this, I actually have a handout which I can send to anybody who isn't who is interested, it's ways to start positive feedback sentences. It's how to couch criticism in positive ways. Because I think this is where a lot of people get put off from competitions. They've had teachers or judges in contests who were picky, critical, crabby, nasty people. And they made the whole experience miserable. I know I had teachers like that. And I vowed I would never be that way, <laughs> but that's important. And if you're running a contest, it's important that you get judges who are going to be humane. Um, I've worked with judges who introduced themselves as I am the East German judge. And you could just see everybody cringe. And you're thinking, oh my God, I know what East German judges are like at the Olympics. This is gonna be awful. Well, that's not a good way to introduce yourself and it's not a good way to be. So, you know, people like that shouldn't be judging. Um, they can learn to judge better. And if you're running contests, I, it's important to, to help them become better judges because judges should be sharing their knowledge and they should be helping people to understand the critique that they're getting the critique hopefully is going to be positive and constructive. It's going to point out what was good and it's going to point out where there are areas for improvement. And that's, you know, that's what competitions, I think, are all about. They're showing you where you can improve, how you can do better, how you can learn more. Um, 
uh, yes, yes, I was thinking of you, Alan. That was the, we all know who you're talking about. Um, so, you know, that's, that's basically what I had to say about this. Um, Steve, you mentioned that you like to do research paper. The research um, paper criteria is very different. Uh, I put it in the chat um, column. I think it's the, the third item up there. Um, there, are, there are three main categories in research paper. Um, research is eight out of the 20 areas. Writing is eight out of the 20 areas. And presentation is four out of the 20. Now, I don't want to go through all the details, but for research paper, you have to know how to write to even get started. Right. And that's a whole other skill. Um, believe me, it took me a year to teach. I taught basically Aristotelian rhetoric, which is how to inform, persuade, or move an audience. And um, <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to that, so I'm mm -hmm. not even going to get started. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I have, I have looked at and actually a couple of years ago, I used the, uh, uh, the rubric for, uh, uh, for research papers. Uh, I thought it was, you know, I thought it was pretty reasonable for, yeah. for what it's covering. Uh, I think whoever wrote it did a good job. Yes, I mean, she is the teacher, and she worked with a good committee. I mean, I think that. I mean, this is such an improvement over what we've had in the past. Um, let me give you guys an example of, of an experience I had that will maybe illustrate some of these points. I made a coat, what a friend of mine calls on tier business casual, the, the uh, early period caftan coat. And my particular interest was in late ninth century, specifically 870 to 880 Northeast France, Carolingian culture. I love the illumination and I could document that at least one noble woman wore a caftan coat. So I made this coat. The Let's see, let's get it up there so that you see it and not the background. That's very weird. Okay, the, this is embroidery and applique on it. Those figures are straight out of the second Bible of Charles the Bald. The back of the coat looks like this. It has more applique and embroidery. The whole thing is made out of pure wool. The seams are hand sewn. The whole thing is hand sewn. No machine got near this. Um, and I love it, but it's not going to hit real hard on authenticity because while I can document the hand sewn stitches, I can document the caftan coat, I can document those designs, I cannot document that they used any kind of embroidery or applique on a coat. What I can document from a slightly earlier period is this coat, which is Merovingian. It's wool lined with cotton and it has card woven trim on the front and on the sleeves. It's not as spiffy, but frankly, it's far more historically accurate. This coat would come out better in a competition than the other one. The other one's flashy, but it's not what the criteria are looking for completely. I entered that in a costume contest at Eggles Tourney a few years back, and I came in second. And I was tickled to death because I thought that was very nice. The person who won it hand sewed his whole outfit and he even cast the pewter buttons. He deserved to win. I got some really good feedback from the judges, Raven Caraton was one of them. She's gonna be doing that class at Eggles on authenticity and documentation. But I learned from that and it was well worth entering the contest. So I had a good time. I came away from it feeling pretty good about what I'd done and knowing that it wasn't first prize, but that was okay, you know? 
I mean, I actually, in that one, I really wanted to win the prize because it was a beautiful set of card weaving. But, you know, you can commission card weaving or you can learn how to card weave. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, so that's, competitions are kind of what you make of them. Um, and if you don't have expectations that set you up to be, feel put down or criticized, um, you can actually make some friends and, and learn stuff from them and forget that it's a competition. It's just a, an experience that you're, you know, it's a, it's a sharing. So anyway, questions? Yes, yeah, Steve? Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, so um, oh, in your introduction, you mentioned that you even know some people who uh, use competitions as um, the motivation to actually get, get something done. Yes. And that's me. <laughs> you too. Um, <laughs> because, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of the stuff that we do, if, um, if you're if you're not making garb and people make garb and you wear it to events and kind of the wearing of it at an event is the use of it. But there are a lot of things that really don't have a practical modern use um, and that you can't necessarily carry around an event and, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, show off what you did. So, but it's something that you're interested in doing. Like, for example, one of my areas of interest has been beekeeping. And so I've made uh, uh, period beehives. Uh, they're really impractical to use as beehives. I mean, if you wanted to keep bees, I would definitely not recommend using medieval beehives. Uh, uh, but it's uh, it was cool to make them, and it's cool to be able to show how it was done uh, at the time. Um, but so the the you know the competition for that gave me the kind of the motivation to actually do it and uh, to be able to show it and and you know just kind of realize a. Uh, uh, realize my goal of actually demonstrating it because otherwise I'd have no, I'd have no uh, venue. I'd have no audience for it. Right. No, that's um, a very good point. You could wear it like yeah. a hat. Yeah. I could wear it like <laughs> a hat. Right. Um, and uh, 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 a couple, a couple other comments, just a, a, a couple things that I've learned uh, while doing, uh, while doing presentations, both uh, SCA and uh, and mundanely. Um, for one thing, for pres for the presentation of your thing, if you have a thing and you lay it out on the table, uh, it can very easily disappear among all of the other things in the competition. Uh, you want to do something to uh, to draw attention to it. And one thing that I have learned is that uh, don't forget that there are three dimensions that you can use. And people uh, oftentimes limit their display to a tabletop, but they don't go up. And things, uh, displays that include vertical display uh, like, you know, if it's something as mundane as a poster board or, uh, you know, a mannequin or something like that really draws people's attention. And in, in, my, uh, in my experience, uh, tends, to, tends to really help to, to draw people. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is actually it's an old, uh, it's an old graduate school trick. Uh, when you're preparing your oral presentation, you know, if you're going to do a, an oral presentation to people and you're going to be fielding questions afterwards, uh, the uh, uh, advice among 
graduate students is always leave some important aspect unanswered. Don't give away all, don't, don't show all of your cards in your presentation. Um, and so the judges, you know, a good judge is going to feel honor bound that they've got to ask you something. And if you can give them something easy to bite on and, uh, you know, an obvious question to ask, then you can sit back and say, hmm, well, you know, that's a really good question. And uh, let's see, I seem to remember that in 1542, there was this, uh, there, you know, there was this particular manuscript here. And if you look at this picture in a, uh, an illustration from the 1300s, uh, you got this. So basically uh, have one or more points that you don't necessarily explain everything about uh, that you can hold in reserve. That, so a, a little, little trick for, uh, uh, for winning presentations. <laughs> depth, exhibiting depth. Yes, right. <laughs> I don't know, other, other questions. Um, I mean, the same stuff would apply to process. You know, if you've recreated the process of dyeing, the process of cooking something or preserving something or brewing something. Um, um, I have a question. It's Emma, mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of for it's for you, and it's also for um, Steve. Um, the upcoming summits ANS championship is more of a body of work uh, as opposed to like an a single thing. Um, do these rubrics that we have? And this is the Kingdom ANS, and I know it's not exactly the same kind of competition, but can these rubrics be useful for preparing for that kind of competition? Uh, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, and that's, uh, first to directly answer your question, no, I don't think so. Um, we'd really have to stretch the kingdom rub rubrics uh, out of shape to, uh, uh, to approach that sort of thing. So, um, so is there going to be a, at least a competitor rubric for well, Kingdom uh, for so, Summit ANS? Right, and uh, I I'm talking with my with the judges. Uh, the way we're handling it, rather than have a crowd of judges that are handpicked to do individual. Uh, uh, entries, uh, we're going to have one group of judges that's going to talk yes. to everybody. It's going to be a very busy time for the judges. Uh, but that way, then the judges at the end can sit down and having together experienced all of the entries, then they can uh, come to an agreement among themselves. Uh, it's unfortunate we don't really have, uh, you know, uh, as Assault was saying, the uh, uh, we don't have the uh, criteria really set out to be able to give to people ahead of time, and that's just kind of a, a byproduct of the uh, just the the strangeness of the situation that we're in and trying to trying to make it a uh, uh, a combined uh, in-person and uh, uh, virtual event. So anyway, I'm, I'm talking to the judges and trying to get them to huddle together and come up with something that will give the uh, the entrance a uh, uh, a concept of what they're looking for. I think you can use material from the rubrics though. I mean, if you look at the overall categories, you've got historical accuracy and authenticity and documentation. You've got the technical ability and complexity and then the presentation. So well, if you, right. 
you look at the big categories, the, the five main categories, not the 20 individual items. Right. Yes, I, I agree. I think that gives you a good, you know, you can look at the, you know, the aesthetic and to, even in the body of work, how often does this person use period methods or tools or techniques or something? And, um, you know, I, I think that you can work with that. And certainly the rubric would help people to pick things that they think would show to best advantage. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Holler, I think I, I see your comment. Thank you for <laughs> I, I, I thought I recognized your name. I remember uh, we spoke at the uh, uh, at the Kaid uh, pentathlon competition. Uh, yeah, doing that uh, that persona presentation was a lot of fun. Uh, very very research intensive, but uh, but yeah, I, I that was a fun memory. Uh, yeah, so back on the the just the question of the the summits uh, competition. Basically, we wanted to try in a, discussing among the group that was that pulling it together, which includes their highnesses. Uh, we wanted to make it something that people could enter even if they haven't necessarily been in S, you know, in heavy duty SCA mode for the last year, working on specific projects or, or whatever. Um, uh, something that people could uh, uh, could have fun with and show what they're doing uh, uh, without the, um, you know, without the kind of the heavy competitive aspect of, you know, a particular uh, object being being judged. So it's an interesting try and we're, we're going to you know, see how well, uh, how well we can do, do with it. So I am um... Would an entry where I null bend and I have where I started and where I am, where I am, and examples okay. all the way down. So would that, if I presented, you know, I, I don't have 20 million things that I do, but it's like, mm -hmm. okay, so this is where I started with null bending with process and research and all the rest of it here is my progress through the years to where i am now that would be really cool i would like to see that that might be a way that might be an option for people who are overwhelmed by the idea of a body of work show everything you've ever done mm -hmm. um i I wouldn't enter a contest that I didn't have a criteria for. I spent a lot, I spent a lot of time in Ansteora running those kind of competitions because I wouldn't, I, I couldn't, I wouldn't do them without people telling me what they wanted from me. Right. Um, and you know, now I'm in a position where I, I don't have a lot of stuff because I'm in, I've moved in transition and stuff, but I have my null bending and I have my samples and I have my course of research. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's a, that's a category to consider a possibility, a way for, for people to, to approach it if they don't feel like they have a ton of things or again, that they really haven't quote unquote done anything recently. Um, just a suggestion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good point. For those of you who were interested in Bardic, there's a whole other set of Bardic um, rubrics, which I didn't feel competent to address, but they can be accessed through the same website area as the other ones um, that we did look at, you know, the, whose URLs are in the, in the chat column.
you know, there's always the, the debate about, you know, should we have a competition? Should we have a display? You know, should we, are people put off by the judging? And I, I think that with, if you kind of understand what it is you want from a contest, you can get a lot out of it without being at all competitive as a person. Um, if you are competitive, great, go for it, have fun, get in there and compete. But if you're going looking to meet people and learn something and talk to the judges afterwards, if you want more feedback, um, it's a great framework for, you know, people and, and more information. You're all asleep, I can tell. No. <laughs> I've just actually been going through in my head some of the things that I have made and wondering like, would how would this apply to this concept of, of historical accuracy in the various levels? And most of my stuff doesn't apply at all um, <laughs> to the historical accuracy, but it is, uh still when i think about things that i might make in the future i'm definitely interested in applying that knowledge yeah and see that's what a good rubric does i mean it gives you a whole bunch of suggestions of things that you could do and that's why it's so important i think to have a good rubric i know when i taught composition having the ap rubric was was really valuable because it was very well explained and kids could see what they were being asked to do that in, in the way of writing. So that, yeah, it says, well, oh, I hadn't thought about period tools. You know, um, what, what would that be? And, you know, and then you're off on another wonderful rabbit hole to find out new stuff. Well, if I could put in another uh, 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 another thing that I learned, and actually I learned this initially from judging in uh, in competitions in Kaid, that if if you're making a thing, um, and a thing that is not like wearable or uh, you know kind of like a tool or a, a piece of armor or some uh, some utensil, um, it really helps to be able to show, show it in action, show it being used. Um, uh, I learned this from, I, I, I judged one category in, uh, in Kaid where, uh, there was a, uh, uh, someone did a, presentation on um, medieval fishing lures. She does uh, fly fishing um, in, you know, mundanely and carried that, in, uh, that interest into, and she makes her own flies. So she did, did the research and uh, came up with uh, uh, resources on how fishing lures were made. Uh, in period and how hooks were made. And uh, so she had a, uh, a series of, of hooks made by different methods that were used in period um, and tied some flies and various lures that were used, uh, that were described in period. And she actually went fishing with them. And she had a picture of the fish that she caught with one of them. It wasn't, it wasn't a big fish. It was not a prize winning fish, but just the fact that she had gone to the extent of actually showing that it does its purpose uh, uh, added a lot to, to uh, her being able to say that this was a uh, that this was a, you know, this was a thing. Uh, 
um, and that it works. So just another another little tidbit that I've learned along the way. It's really cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the best ways to learn about how to compete is to judge. Yeah. I just like, you know, one of the best ways to learn how to do something is to teach it. Now I'm going to ask you guys, having heard this, what turned into more of a talk than a discussion, what would improve it? If I were to do this again, what would you like to see added or taken out or um, done differently? Hmm. Hello. Um. Perhaps it'd be better if you had a specific item and you <clears throat> pretended that this item was being judged. Mm. <clears throat> and you said, well, looking at this item, <clears throat> it looks like it was you know, machine bound. It was this, that, or the other thing. The more focused you are on an item, the better you could describe the process. Yeah, that's really good feedback. Thank you. So initially, I had a lot of hesitancy. I, I shared that with you some other time about entering competitions. And what I'm finding through what you've shared is that most of my considerations were ill-founded because my thoughts were, how can I enter, um, say, a fired bowl? against someone's incredibly beautiful woodworking or leatherworking or something like your beautiful caftan, a little ceramic bowl just has no chance. And so, oh, well, that's all right. I liked making the bowl. Now I understand the, the basis of com competing totally different items in the same event. And it was because of your explanation with the rubric and taking the time to share this with us. So thank you for that. Thank you. Well, I'm glad it worked because, yeah, I mean, it's, I just hate to see people feel anxious about this when it could, you know, it can be kind of fun, actually. <laughs> I've got an a odd criteria. One. Oh, sorry. I couldn't see somebody else was saying something. Having a criteria that I actually knew I was going to be judged on first really would have helped take away a lot of the stress a long time ago. So I'm glad that someone has um, come up with this. Thank you, yeah. Uh, yes, onto your desk shadow judge, you can be a student judge um, at uh, I think Kingdom a &S competitions and sometimes at others. Um, you, you can ask to do that at any event and, you know, just see whether people let you kind of come along and, and mark your own sheet and then compare it with the judges afterwards in terms of how you perceived it and they perceived it. But yes, that's a great way to learn how to judge is to just shadow judge. Yeah, the last kingdom arts and science, I think, was in Pasco. And I went out with Lady Alice and I asked if I could be a, a student judge and they gave me the rubric, but my paper was canary yellow. So it was kind of like the English L plate or having training wheels or a shaved tail or something. Everybody knew that I was the student. And I was, you know, they said, well, you know, we'll have the judges sit in the front row. And, and if you like, you could sit behind them and just swatch and see what happened. And what we were judging was uh, somebody who was making Anglo-Saxon liars. I said, oh, much laughter in the background well, from me. I said, oh, after about my third or fourth question, they said, oh, why don't you move up to the front row here? How many liars have you made? Yes. Oh, about a dozen or so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it was, I, I really cannot recommend 
highly enough how even if you're not a judge, if you could ask to sit in the room and listen in on the conversation between the judges as they sit around the table. Uh, I mean, that alone, they, I'm not sure that they, they can kick you out unless you're one of the contestants. <clears throat> if, you, if, you can't, <clears throat> if you can't get your, your request in early enough, if you just request, if you're allowed to sit at the table and listen quietly and take notes, that, that in itself would be a learning experience. <clears throat> the room where it happens, as it were. Uh, very interesting discussions around the table as everybody's going over this paperwork, deciding whether it was a three or a four. <clears throat> it is difficult <clears throat> that we, we have to do with integers. There's a lot of people that say, can't I give it a three and a half? No, it's three or a four. Anya, did you have a comment before? No, Steve? Anya, were, were, were you trying to say something? Yeah, I was earlier. I, I was trying, and I was trying to speak and didn't realize I was muted. Um, <laughs> I have a kind of an oddball question because every time I've won a competition, um, it was an accident that I was even there. And I know that sounds really strange, but. Uh, it, you know, usually somebody says at the last minute, we don't have enough entrance, you know, uh, why don't you come and do something? Or uh, another one was I got dragged in as part of a bet, sort of. Um, you know, I, I bet you that, you know, if you get involved in the competition, you're going to win. And I said, oh, no, there's no way. Well, and I did. What, what do you think? would be that that happens. Um, I, I am not a comp competitive person uh, at all, particularly. Um, I've judged a ton I, I, because I've been involved with ANS for 40 years. It's, you know, I've, I've judged. Um, but when I bring stuff for a competition, actually, as all, you've seen my stuff. Uh, you saw the result of me <laughs> winning by accident. Um, what do you think it would be that would make that possible even? Uh, well, things are going on. One is if you don't expect to learn, you don't have ex expectations, you're not uptight about it. It's like, whatever, you know, so you're relaxed. I mean, I think I was one of the judges when you won Summit's Alpine Scholar. Yep. Yeah. And you, you know, you just did your thing. You had toys and I forget what all. And, you know, you just, you talked about them. And I mean, I think that backing into something like that, you're, you're in a much more relaxed and natural place. And the stuff, you know, just comes out, you know, it's not like you get stage fright because you're not on stage. You're just, you're just there talking with friends. I think I think that 40 years of judging might have something to do with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can see that. Yeah, it was uh, black work and wood carving were the other two things. Yeah. And for the Alpine Scholar competition, I didn't even know who the judges were. I had no clue. So I just behaved the way I do at things like demos. Somebody asked me a question, you know, you punch the right button, the Anya lecture falls out. <laughs> well, that's right. I mean, because that's what's authentic. I mean, that's authenticity. You know something because you do it. And if you do it in the period way, it's authentic. You know, you're just talking about what you did, whether it's how you peel, peeled carrots or, or whatever. You know, um, and I think that's that's the secret is for teaching and for, I mean, giving a presentation or giving a talk is if you, you just make sure you've mastered your material, then you can deal with whatever comes up because it's just something you know. And it's when you're not sure of it that it's easier to be apprehensive and 
um, not really sure what you should say. And you, you get that by just sitting around with friends and geeking about it and talking about it and knowing it. <laughs> geeking, I love. <laughs> I speculate that almost everyone in the SCA is pro at geeking. Well, right. And, you know, I think uh, what I was going to say was, I think a lot of the perception or, or uh, angst about competitions comes from what you've described as the, the East German judge uh, syndrome. And uh, judges who um, who make people feel uncomfortable do a real disservice to the whole uh, operation, to the future of you know future competitions by convincing people not to do it. If it's not fun, um, you know. I mean, we're we're all learning this stuff. We're all, you know, I mean, the whole, uh, I, you know, our middle name is creative. We're all kind of making this up as we go along. Um, and it should be fun to geek about what you're doing. Yeah. And as, you know, Anya said, if you're, when you're, uh, when you're comfortable, when you're uh, not necessary, you know, you're not uh, anxious or, uh, worried about the outcome and you're just talking about stuff that you love to talk about it comes out naturally so I think a lot of it has to do with training judges and or selecting the appropriate people as judges uh, who are not going to poison the well right and the other part of that is it's same same kind of thing is giving positive feedback constructive right criticism pointing out what is good and where there can be improvement not you did that wrong <laughs> i mean who wants to hear something presented like that you know you say well you know if you folded your seam edges under you wouldn't have to deal with the little scruffly ends and you'd have a more comfortable garment and that's actually how it was done in period because fabric was so precious that you didn't want it to unravel so you finished all the seams because it made it more secure well if you say that instead of you didn't finish your seams that looks terrible mm -hmm. well and also if you look at it i mean for for a judge if a judge you know if you look at it from the point of view that gee just about everybody that enters a competition is not going to win it right so you by giving positive feedback, uh, even the people who don't win the competition come away with something. They get come away with information. They come away with encouragement, um, and uh, and you know to, to kind of you know not to get into platitudes, but sort of everybody wins. Yeah. Um, well, there's. Nothing if, wrong if with everybody If there are losers, winning. then it sucks. <laughs> Sorry, Emma, what? It's like there's nothing wrong with everybody winning. I think that's awesome. <laughs> um, I think that's a successful, you know, event. Yeah. Um, and yeah, this because everybody's this, gotten something. And this is where things like um, recognition tokens come in for everybody for judges, for uh, the populace, where they leave a token of this rocked my world, you know, business card, a bead, just something that says, I saw it, I liked it. Um, I have all of mine. <laughs> I kept all of my tiny little, it's like, oh, except for the candy kisses, I ate those. Um, <laughs> they wouldn't last anyway. Yeah. So that is that is something to consider when I shadow judged, I shadowed, it was in Ansteora and I shadow judged and it was, you know, it was in fiber and it was in, um, and I was following um, a Laurel who is superb. And I learned one thing, I am much 
harder. It's like I would be that Laurel. So um, it's like, really? You think that's worth that? Really? <laughs> but there's this, 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 and this. So I learned that about myself, um, both as a judge and as a competitor, which helped me recalibrate on a lot of on a lot of areas about what's what's good enough, you know? What's good enough to try with. It doesn't have to be as perfect as you know it could be. Um, and especially if you are keeping track of your progress and can look back and go, wow, look what I can do now. Um, that's something to consider as a competitor and as a judge, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, and it also helps. I mean, this isn't competitions, but I've joined a lot of Facebook chat groups that are based in Europe, and European reenactors are authenticity Nazis. I mean, they really are. Um, they go after because they get hired at real historical places. That's kind of how they support themselves sometimes. You know, they'll go do a gig at this ruined castle or something, and, you know, they are from skin out, totally authentic, and they can be kind of critical sometimes. They always go LARP slash SCA yeah. <laughs> stuff. We have a bad reputation there, but I've, I've learned an enormous amount by being part of those groups because the level of expertise is such that what's being shared is like research quality. In fact, I mean, you get archaeologists sneaking a photo onto the Viking group saying, this is what I dug up today. We haven't cleaned it yet, but look at this. You know, I'm going, oh my God, I'm seeing this before it's published. You know, So, I mean, there's there are ways to up your game um, by just kind of hanging out in places like that too and watching how people give feedback to each other because a lot of these people knew e know each other in these groups i mean they've been to international things and that's that's been really nice to see them point out very precise and technical and real criticisms like well i don't think the dating is right on that but this is why you know and then back it up so that's that's also been um you know a way to in a sense learn to be a good judge I think there's there's a fascination for me in the comparison between the British groups and the North American and elsewhere groups, because they do have access to the originals that none of the rest of us have access to. I it's know. totally unfair. I but just I joined that. a group, West Stowe Anglo-Saxon Village. I was actually there years and decades ago. Um, and they have reenactors who come in and, and do their thing for school kids and, and the public. And they do have a, 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 a Facebook group that you can join. And it's amazing. I mean, they get to do what we do in the SCA, only they're doing waddle and daub. They just rethatched one of the houses. You know, this is real stuff because in West Stowe, the original idea was to build the houses. It was an excavation and they rebuilt the houses in the post holes that they found. And the idea initially was that they were going to build a Gruben house, one with the dugout floor and one of these and one of those and a hall and a chicken coop and a this and a that. And then they were going to let them fall down and rot and see what they looked like. They were going to burn one down and see what that looked like That's so that they had a better idea of what it was they were digging up. You know, if it ends up rotting, it looks like this. So if we dig this up, maybe this was, you know... I think it's been so successful that they haven't actually gone through the let's destroy it part because it looks like it's all still there. But yeah, when you've got something like that within an hour's drive of you, it sure inspires authenticity because the setting is real. They did not I mean, intentionally burn one down, but weren't one similar situation in somewhere in England was vandalized and burned down and they used oh. that for the research yeah it's, and it's they posted all experience. A, a big article about that <laughs> so it's fascinating it's 
it's a dirty shame we're not able to just hop on a bus and run right over there. But we can access them. That's the beauty of the virtual world we're having to live in anyway. I mean, yeah. we've got people here tonight from far away. Yeah. And not as not as far as some nights. I mean, some nights we have people from Australia and who knows where. But we can connect. We can connect one-on-one, -on -one, people to people. We can share this information in a real personal kind of way. So it's not for those that maybe don't learn from books as well as they learn from, hey, Fred, what do you got? Well, I made this with my hands today. You know, everybody's got their own learning levels. And having this one-on-one -on -one connection through the virtual world has changed the whole game. You know, when we all started, there's quite a few of us here tonight who are old timers. <laughs> when we started this game, we didn't have this. <laughs> and yeah. it was, well, Thorgear showed me how to do this. And Ulfiden had a forge and let's go learn that. Now we get to talk to the people that put their hands on it. I I've said before, I I'm really fortunate I got to know my grandmother who lived to be 98 and she talked with me about the conversation she had with a relative who fought in the civil war that connection was so real and so amazingly wonderful now we can talk to people there who have those things in their hand it's the same kind of connection it makes it real it makes it tangible it makes it reachable so we can really gain from this. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, one of my goals in the SCA and always has been is helping people understand how much fun it is to do research and try and do it historically. I mean, it's a marvelously complicated and engaging game. And you just keep trying it until you get it right to your satisfaction and then you move on to the next craft <laughs> <laughs> i have someone in my family who says why what are you making there well we're making looms what are you going to do with those well we're going to make trim why because we're going to put it on our clothes really well yeah why are you doing all that <laughs> because why it's not? fun <laughs> i mean you could do crossword puzzles or you could learn how to card uh, exactly maybe. They're exactly. both fun. <laughs> Why do you need a mortar and pestle? We have a blender because the yeah. texture is different. Right, right. They taste all different. <laughs> I actually, had, I actually had a had a Laurel say, well, with cooking, is there a difference between using um, a food processor and, you know, like a knife? I said, yes, there's a very different texture between that and, you know, like you get a chunk of beef, you put it in the food processor and you're going to get a very different texture, very different moisture, moisture level than you will if you take the cleaver and go whackety whack, 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 and Wait. until you get the mints that you want. Um, I would absolutely not. Um, it's hard whacking something to, you know, mints with a cleaver. Um, it It's it's hard. Um, so that would be one of the things that I think that goes to the, the um, okay, you know, I'm 55. My shoulder can't do this anymore. This is what they did. Here's the illustrations. Here's the documentation. Here's my young house servant, like is old Bianca, you know, here's Sven. <laughs> we let Sven go choppy choppy, you know, right. <laughs> but have if you have that awareness, it's like, I can't, I can't do low, low whirl spin, spinning. I can't. And that is like the predominant um, spinning technique in most of the textile areas that I'm interested in. And you cannot tell from the yarn, whether it was a high whirl, which I can spin with or low whirl, you can't tell. And you can't tell if a um, this staff was used to, you know, to, it, it is something, but, but you should, you should fess up. I think, you know, it's like, this is what they would have done. 
I technically can't do it. I can technically do this. This is a period technique, but not a period technique for this culture's textile, textile as far as the archaeological remains indicate. And that's, um, I mean, being able to explain that, you get points for that. Yeah. With this rubric. That's why I like the rubric. Daniel, do you, know, you have a... Um, I just wanted to share a small story. Okay, I am about 45 minutes from Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, New York was heavily involved in the War of 1812. The Buffalo Maritime Center has decided they are going to build a ship like the ones that were used in the War of 1812 the way it would have been built. Ooh. I am friends with several blacksmiths who have been asked to make all the metal parts for the ship. And last month we were working on the hinges for the, for the uh, hatches. And the Maritime Center said, okay, we've done this template out of cardboard. Here's what we want you to do. And we gave them back something similar and said, well, why did you follow our template? It doesn't work. Here, let me show you why we changed this. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I've already published like two articles in our local newsletter on making hatches, uh, hinges for hatches and uh, brackets for dead eyes, which is the portion when you're making a pulley out of wooden rope, uh, wood and rope. The dead eyes is the wooden sections that the rope feeds through, and you have the uh, brackets around them to hold them shut so that they don't split open. But we're doing piece by piece of the ship, and it's fascinating. You know, the the experts at the museum are saying, "We want this here. Give us this." Like, okay, here's why we changed it. And well, I'm that's what is so good about material culture. I mean, I remember having a conversation back in the mid 80s, I was relatively new to the SCA and I was at an alumni gathering and this academic was there. She was a history professor, probably from Vancouver, BC. And I said something about, oh, I was, you know, I was involved in this SCA. Oh, well, we don't want to know what kind of stools they sat on, do we? And I thought, yeah, we do. <laughs> You know, because it's part of the world. And, and now we can do that. And you learn things. You learn a lot of stuff. Like you can't just make a hasp like that because it doesn't work. And people have come to respect recreation um, a lot more. I mean, it's amazing the difference in, in the academic world. Because now you get these academics who are a part of these discussion groups. And... Uh, yeah, chicken wallows weren't ritual. I mean, it's, <laughs> they wanted a dust bath. Um, but if you don't know anything about chickens, you're not going to understand why there was a, a hole to the right of the doorway in your Iron Age roundhouse. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, we've been vindicated. <laughs> <laughs> so all of these connections that we make, through having someone like Damon Salt and uh, Steve, I don't have your proper title in my simple brain, but a man mm -hmm. of exalted title and Dagonal, a lot of you here have had wonderful experiences that have gained you recognition that you're now sharing with others. And we get to put forward this knowledge of the past to better our experience of the present because now we know oh they had these nifty little stools and they were small and narrow and hard and they probably didn't sit on those for 10 hours watching tv like americans do now in our big softy cushy couches life was different there's so much knowledge to be gained from even what kind of stools did they sit on yeah yeah So thank you, I appreciate you. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot of positive feedback from tonight's class. 
Well, if anybody wants a copy of my handout, which is basically the notes I was talking from, um, I'll put my um, email address in the, I'm Pam at bobwhitman.com. I'm also Pam Perryman on Facebook. Um, so contact me if you'd like a copy of the handout and I can message or, or email it to you. Um, but if you don't, or if you haven't already done so, look at those rubrics because they can be really useful. So tonight's class has been recorded. It will be made into a YouTube. The link for the YouTube will be placed in the discussion section under this event. You found this event to come tonight. All you have to do is find it again, go to the discussion underneath. There will be a link for the YouTube and a link for the chat, which has the links for all of the rubrics that Pam has shared with us tonight. And class, uh, you could put a, a link there for the handout if you want as well, Pam. Um, you mean to the Facebook group thing? Under this event, this event, everybody had to go to this event to click right. to be here. And if you go to that event, there's a thing that says discussion. There's about and there's discussion. Mm -hmm. Click discussion and it's just like comments under any post. And we can add in each comment, we can add links. Oh, okay. So you could put your class handout link there where we're also going to put the YouTube link and the text link, chat, chat link that has the links for the rubrics. Okay. So anybody you know who missed tonight can find it there. It will be probably tomorrow morning for the YouTube's up because it takes a couple hours for the converting to happen on my sad, sorry little computer. <laughs> but it does happen, yay! Um, one thing I'd like to offer also for people who are uh, interested in working up some of their projects for competitions um, uh, or for doing research in general, kind of one of my uh, specialties that I've developed is how to, how to do uh, quality research online um, and spend very little or, or no money uh, while you're doing it. Basically just where to find free, free information online. And uh, uh, I've uh, developed some expertise in that. And I've, I've taught a class on that here. Uh, if anyone hasn't seen my information on that, I'd be happy to share that. It's really um, good. <laughs> and I'm, I'm constantly learning more. Uh, it's, you know, the more digging, the more rabbit holes I dive into, the more I, uh, the more things that I find. And, uh, you know, and people have been posting new, uh, uh, new websites that have, you know, uh, this, this museum or, or uh, this university has posted some new collection of stuff. And it, it's just, it's mind boggling, the amount of great information that you can get for free online. Steve, uh, a couple and then of if you have easy access to a major university library, then that just multiplies it many fold. And uh, I can help you find the stuff that you need. So, so Steve, I'll, I'll offer that if you if if anyone would like some uh, some help with that. A couple of years ago, pre-COVID, you did a nice class for ANS here in Audiantum mm -hmm. on just that. You had a PowerPoint presentation, and if you have some links to that information that you presented then and the additional stuff you're coming across feel free to add that to this discussion underneath this event. Okay, uh, yeah, and um, Assault published uh, my, my latest version in the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the baronial newsletter as well. The bicranial right. bear? 
Yeah. Yes, and you can find that by going to the Barony of Adiantum's website, not Facebook, but website. Just Google Barony of Adiantum, and in the under archive, you just run down and um, it'll say bicranial bear, and it was in the November one. I think it was November, yeah. Yeah, I think it was the November one. They're all, they're October, November, December, and I'm pretty sure it's it's the uh, it, November one. Um, so it's available there too. And actually, I will be putting my handout in the next issue of our newsletter, the Bicranial Bear, which will be in the archive section of the Baronial website. That'll well, probably come out another week or so. So I think, unless you have more that you want in the recording, I'll go ahead and end the recording so we can get that converted tonight. Anything else you wanted to have included? Not me. Huge thank you for this class, Dana Salt. Mm -hmm. And I My will pleasure. end the recording, but that does not mean we're done here. <laughs>